Hey, everybody. Happy Friday. Okay. So I am joined by my illustrious co-host, Greg Gifford, who's coming back from Brighton SEO. Well, this is an old slide. So, but hey, it is what it is. So if you want to reach Greg, you can reach him at Search Ledge Digital. Uh, he's also at Greg Gifford. Me, Ben Fisher, you can reach me at steadydemand.com. And of course, on Twitter all the time at the social dude. Eric is no longer with us, uh, but he's here in spirit. Uh, if you'd like, you can always join us on Local Marketing Institute Connect on Facebook, where we have lots of members that are there and very, very, very helpful. And we keep up to date on news and what's going on in local. And then finally, you can subscribe to our podcasts on Google, Apple, Spotify, and our heart radio. Join us. We'd love to have you. All right. And with that, uh, we have to go over here and all right, we are live, Greg. How's it going, buddy? Welcome uh, back. You know, I'm recovered. Uh, I have for everyone to see like super bloody eyeballs because I was violently ill. And apparently if you uh, puke enough, you can break blood vessels in your eyeballs. So Yikes. it was not a fun <laughs> week last week. No, but you seem like you're doing great now. I'm great now, you know, and, and it's nice to be back. You know, I was in Brighton for a week, which was Nice to get back overseas and see all my British friends and European friends and do a big, massive digital marketing conference. It was it was awesome. Right on, right on. Tell us a little bit about what you were speaking about, man. So I they, Brighton SEO is now a two-day conference. It used to be a single day. And so now it's Thursday and Friday. And then the day before, they have various uh, masterclass training sessions that are, I mean, I think it's like a thousand bucks US to do the all-day training. And so I did an all-day training class on local SEO and I had... Jeez, probably 16, 17 people in there. Shout out to everybody who took my training class if you're watching. Nice. Uh, so I did an all-day training class on local SEO and all the changes to Google business profiles and everything that's happened in the last two years. So that was a lot of fun. Uh, you know, it's always neat when you can not have to constrain everything down into a half-hour session. I had four and a half hours cumulative of talking about local SEO and, and teach people how to be better. So that was cool. And then in the actual conference proper, I uh, did a session about giving better reporting to clients and oh, nice. kind of went off on a rant about how most people really overload clients with tons and tons of data. And just because we care about monitoring something doesn't mean a client cares about it. and doesn't mean it even matters to a client. So right. it was kind of a big thing about let's take a step back and not give the same reports we've always been giving and giving reports that are actually valuable to the client. So it was, it was cool. It was fun. Yeah, it's one thing I've definitely learned in my agency life is, you know, ask your clients, what do they care about? What do they want? Usually it comes down to sales. You know, it's all about conversions at that point. Cool. Anything else uh, come, you know, that you saw in Brighton that you want to talk about? I mean, I heard Morty had actually a pretty good presentation. Yeah, Morty was the first presentation in the main room and his was awesome. Uh, I think like the two that really resonated me with the most uh, were the two keynotes each day. And so one was Andy Jarvis. Uh, he's a, an Irish dude. And uh, his whole thing was more about just, you know, talk to your clients and and connect with your clients. And it was a lot about the difference between strategy and tactics. And I've even caught myself saying things at this conference I just got back from this week. It was in Kentucky, where one of his little things was, you know, strategy is where are you going? And tactics are, how do you get How'd there? You get there, you know. And I, th I thought that was a great way to kind of talk about it. And he had some really cool stuff in there talking about how a lot of digital marketers, they're all about tactics and they don't really pay attention to strategy. And tactics without strategy doesn't really net good results. So yeah. that one was a really dynamic, fun one. And then Kirsty Hulse did the closing keynote of the whole thing, and uh, she has a whole like her her job now. Like you know, COVID happened and. Everybody kind of switched up and now her entire company is all about training people to do public speaking. And she's done a lot of training on public speaking and got up there and talked about how, you know, everybody's nervous. Like I get nervous when I speak and, you know, I do it all the time and people are surprised about that. Sure. And it was, you know, talking about, you know, imposter syndrome and how it's okay to be nervous. It's okay to be anxious. Like that's not bad. That's normal. Everybody is to some degree or another. And so yep. it was a that's kind right. of a mental health focused presentation that was really cool and then I, did, I mean awesome. i saw a bunch of stuff yeah i put a video up i don't know if, if anyone uh ever regularly watches my tuesday video series that i do on the search lab blog but 
I uh, just put up a video that was kind of a compilation of a bunch of different tips that I got from various speakers and other experts that were there. And, you know, one of the coolest things I got to hang out with Claire Carlisle in person for the first time hey. in several years. So that <laughs> right was on. awesome. And uh, Andrew Optimizey. And so there was a lot of a lot of local SEO people there and a lot of a lot of friends I hadn't seen in years. So it was awesome. Very cool. Yeah. I mean, I don't know, man, I'm about you, but I am dying and looking forward to local you. I cannot wait for that. I am <laughs> so excited. You know, I, I typically it's going to sound really kind of bougie, but I don't usually go to conferences if I don't speak at the conference. Cause I just, I speak at so many events. It's just hard for me to go just to go. Right. Uh, and, 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 you know, plus, you know, most of us are talking about this stuff on, on Slack or to each other all the time anyway. So it's not like I need to go to a conference to stay up to date with stuff. Yeah. But uh, you know, I'm going to pitch for, for local you, but even if I don't get to speak, I'm going anyway. Like yeah, there's no here. way I'm going to miss seeing everybody for the first time in years. No, it's going to be one big party. Heck yeah, it, Trisha. Yeah. Hope to see you there. Be awesome. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, imposter syndrome is totally real. It really is. It doesn't matter how elevated you get in your industry or how well-known you are. When you get up on stage, you're kind of like, shit. <sighs> I mean, I know I'm speaking. You know, now, I've got, I've got two now the hours. crazy thing is, is, you know, we're getting older and you got all these up and coming new speakers that are, you know, in their twenties and, you know, it's not even like it's their first time speaking. They've been speaking for years and, Man, these young whippersnappers need to get off my lawn. No, like these, <laughs> these these younger these younger guys and gals are amazing, and they're they're killing it. And now yeah, it's like, are. geez, man, like I gotta up my game because like these these people are brilliant. They're so good. So you know, just, it was just <laughs> it was just so amazing to do a massive. I mean, it was like I think three or four thousand people. It was a really big conference. So nice. it was awesome to be back in person at events you know morty morty had a, a speaker dinner the the i think the night before the conference that that wicks through and so we had a, a good group of people that got together for that and it was just it was so awesome seeing everybody more than anything else it was really cool hanging out with people in person again right on right on all right so let's see a uh, little piece of news for everybody you've probably all gotten two emails about this so far. The first email, eh, somebody in communications kind of messed up over at Google. Uh, surprise, surprise, right? Wait, so you're saying somebody at, group, at Google screwed up on something? Yeah, I know, right. <laughs> uh, they sent this email out, and first of all, in the email, it said Google my business. It didn't say Google business profile. Um, yeah, let's keep those tasks up. Um, but anyway, so yeah, so, um, but now and then once we saw this, um, we all, all of us, basically the P started getting emails from our clients saying, is Google my business going away? What's going on? All this email was about, and the, the one I'm talking about everybody is where it says that, you know, brand accounts, basically, if you have a brand account, you won't be able to access your Google, my business profile, period. Brand accounts came about when they had Google local switched over to Google plus local or whatever the hell they called it back then. And um, so whenever you created a Google places, let's add another name. Why don't we now a Google plus local page, which was your, now your Google business profile, but then it was Google profile page. It would create it under something which is called a brand account. Now a brand account, did not have a user associated with it. It had a Google plus local email, basically, that was created in the background. Nobody ever saw it. Um, you will still see it. However, if you're an agency owner, if you accept a listing, you'll notice it comes from this kind of email address. But anyway, so what happened was, is after they shut down Google plus, um, basically all these legacy pages were sitting out there. So you had Google places pages, Google local pages, then the Google plus pages, everything before was okay. The Google plus pages are not. So what you had to do with this update of this dep for, because of the deprecation is you basically have to go to brand accounts, which is ungodly difficult to get to. Um, and you have to basically opt in to 
what effectively is putting an owner or a manager on the page, which you already have. So this messaging was extremely confusing. People thought Google, uh, my business was going away. And so um, we let them know about it and they sent out another communication and a post basically saying, and they added it in there, click this link so you can do the process. And now it's, it works. However, I will say this, if you ignored it the first time, Make sure you do go back through your emails and click those links, because if you don't, those pages will go away. The ones that don't have a owner or a manager associated with them. So that's that. That's my PSA for the day. (laughs) What's the over under on how long it's going to take us to comfortably say Google business profile and not get tongue tied? I'm going to say at least a year. Yeah, that's what I think, too. Yeah, at least. I mean, yeah, I don't think there's any way around it, Greg. We're going to need to get some sort of, I can't use the, but we're going to have to have some other sound effect for whenever one of us says Google My Business from now on. Yeah, or at Local U, I think what we should do is we should have a game, and that is if you say Google My Business, you take a drink. Oh, yeah, let's do that. Yes, there you go, Tricia. See, great minds. (laughs) Because then everybody at the everybody at the event will be just totally sloshed before the evening. (laughs) Yeah, probably be that way anyway. But, you know, probably, probably. Oh, uh, you'll know it's a Erica, you'll know it's a brand account. If you um, you go to that email, it has a link. You just click on the link and basically it'll tell you, it'll either say you don't have any brand accounts, which case you're okay. Um, Or what it's going to say is, is do you want to opt in to convert these to regular accounts? And you just say yes. And anything that you're associated with, with that email is then converted. So you're good. You know, if you've got a couple hundred or like, I mean, we've got thousands of accounts, but they're all in like four email addresses. So we just clicked on it four times, basically, and then we were we were set. So um, hopefully that answers your question. All right. So Greg, this one's for you. Um, need to verify address. Phone wrong. What you got? Yeah. So we've seen this pop up. I mean, it always comes up, but it's been popping up a lot lately in the community forum where people want to verify their business or they need to re-verify their business, but the address is incorrect and you can't update the address. All you can do is request the postcard. And what do you do? Because the postcard is obviously not going to come to you. Sounds super janky, but really the only thing to do in that case is request the postcard and then wait the 12 to 14 business days. And when the postcard does not arrive, then you contact support and let support know, hey, look, I got the postcard, but it didn't show up because it's the wrong address and I can't edit it. And then they can help you get verified that way. Same thing with the phone number. Sometimes you need to re-verify and the phone number is incorrect and you can't update the phone number. And yet they're wanting to do a verification phone call. Same situation, attempt verification. When verification doesn't work because it's not the right information, then contact support and say, hey, I couldn't verify because of this and support will help you get verified. Yeah. And technically what you could do is if it's the phone issue is you could just switch the method to postcard. If it's letting you. The problem is sometimes you do not have the option to switch verification methods. And in that case, you kind of have to just try it because if you just go right to support and you haven't tried to verify, then support's not really going to be very. They're going to say, try to verify first. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's a waste of time. Yep. Yeah. So now you're up and yes. we have something to chat about from the local search forum about insurance providers and what's yeah. been changed there. Mm. Hey, we should ask Barry, is this new? Yep. It's new. New. <laughs> nope, it's not new. <laughs> so insurance sources have been definitely showing up on Google business profiles for a while, right? Um, but there's not been any kind of clarification as to where this data is coming from. Like, you know, is it coming from somebody else? Is it coming from my website? What? And so now they've updated their help documents to actually include what those sources are. And it's about four sources, I believe. 
So, um, so that's kind of neat. I've dropped a link, you know, in our chat, if anybody wants to go read up on that. Uh, let's see. Somebody has a question here really quick. So if I set up a Google profile and don't have an address, I can choose a method to uh, verify other than the postcard. Every Google profile, business profile has an address. Um, we see this actually, I'm going to, I'm going to bring that, I'm going to address this really quick because I see this in the forum too often. Yep. People think that because they have a service area based business that there is no address. And so therefore they don't have to postcard verify. This is completely incorrect. Everything has an address. So even if you're a service area based business and you work out of your home and you're not showing your address, you still have an address and you still need to verify at that address. So, um, and it's when you're during the sign up flow, it even states this. So, you, yes, you have an address. You can't just choose another method. Sorry, uh, there, Dre. All right. Yeah, I mean, really, it comes down to you've got to use the verification mes- method or methods that are offered to you. So, if you are offered multiple methods, sure, you don't have to do the postcard. But if you're only offered the postcard, that's what you have to do. You don't have a choice. Exactly. <clears throat> exactly. You, you can't just request, you know, I want to do it by text or phone. It's uh, how spammers do it. All right. So, Greg, we got a question for you from Esperanza Dominguez. And that is what should the best location page show? What is the best structure and how should it link it internally and to where? Well, the answer to that is eh, it depends. If we're talking about a location landing page for a website that has multiple locations and you are wanting to link from your Google business profile to that location page, that's one thing. If you're talking about a city page where you're creating a page that you just want to try to target showing up in search results in another city other than where you're located, that's a totally different thing. I'm going to assume that this is what is your Google business profile landing page need to look like. So there's a lot of different ways to do this. You do want to be sure that if we're talking your location landing page, clearly this is meaning a multi-location business that has a single website. You need to have information about the business. That is the page that your local business schema should be on. You should have obviously name, address, phone number in there. You should have information on how to contact, information on your hours, information about that specific location, a photo of the location, Everything that's useful and relevant to a potential customer that is looking to come to do business there. Now, a lot of people are going to default to just maybe a picture and address and phone number and that's it. You need more meat there. You need to talk about the location, all the sort of stuff that you would normally do with local SEO. Who are you? Why are you awesome? Where are you located? Talk about the local area. Uh, When I did this in my training class in Brighton, one of the things I talked about is if you do need to do these location landing pages, some really good examples of well-done location landing pages are REI and Home Depot and Whole Foods. All three of those do a really great job of awesome, relevant, robust local landing pages. You don't want to have kind of just the same format where all you're really doing is changing out the address and the phone number because there's no value to that. So make it awesome, make it robust. As far as how it's structured, I mean, do it whatever looks good on your website. Obviously, how should it be linked throughout the site? That can get really complex and technical. It kind of depends on whether you're a a service business that has multiple service areas and that's location, or if you're a location-based business and you have products or services that are only available at that location or they're available across the board, depending on how competitive your vertical is and how dense the competition is in your local area, you might be okay with just a single list of product or service pages. If it is more complex, you're probably going to need to do more of like a local content silo where you've got those product or service pages for each individual location, along with just the generic ones. It can get very complex. I actually, uh, when I'm done talking here, I will share some links in the chat to videos that I've done about how to do city pages and how to do local content silos that will hopefully explain this a little bit better and not have to have me talking for the next 20 minutes to answer the question. <laughs> uh, can you click on the applause button, please? Yeah. There we go. Excellent. Now we need a, a mic drop sound. I'm and saying. our next question is for you, my friend, and yeah. it is, I have seen Google review link generators and wondered if I can create my own using 
search.google.com slash local slash write review question place ID equals whatever the place ID is. So this question is brought to us by Paul Lemplin. Hi, Paul. I don't know if you're with us today, but we're going to answer this question. So the short answer is, yep, you can do it. Uh, The long answer is, why would you want to? Hey, Paul, good to see you. Um, The real question is, why would you want to? And the reason I ask this question is this, is that you could spend your time maybe programming something else um, because there already are these tools out there. So WhiteSpark's got one, Plepper's got one, GatherUp has one. Um, There's all sorts of review generator style tools. So yeah. So anyway, yeah, the short answer, yeah, go for it. Uh, the long, like I said, long answer is mm, maybe think about something else that's not in the done in the industry yet, if you're looking at it for uh, promotional purposes. Okay, cool. Hopefully that answers your question. All right. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. Okay, Greg, this one's for you, bud. Let's see. Uh, this is brought to us by Caleb Sell. All right, Caleb. So is it better to select one business category versus multiples? I've read conflicting information about categories. Some say selecting one is better and selecting multiple and selecting multiple confuses Google. Others say multiple is better. Does it depend on the business? It does not actually depend on the business. Uh, there is a lot of conflicting information. You'll probably come across if you're digging into this, some stuff from three, four, five, six years ago, talking about category dilution and don't choose too many categories. And Google has even said only choose. I remember something specifically in the health document that said only choose the most specific category that applies to your business. And then now they say it's okay to select everything. You've got 10 category slots. The most important thing to remember is, your primary category is a little bit more weighted and you're more likely to show up in searches for whatever that primary category is. So be strategic there. But you don't want to go down the route of saying, I am a pizza restaurant and that's all you pick, even though you have restaurant or Italian restaurant or whatever. You don't want to pick unrelated categories. You want to make sure that they are related categories that actually apply to what you do. If so, pick all the categories that work up to the 10. But what you don't want to do is pick unrelated. So it's not that Google is confused that you have too many. It's that Google gets confused when you pick something that is clearly unrelated. Like Darren did a really cool study on this, I think a year or two ago, where he had a, you know, the white spark listing and it was all about, you know, marketing services and software. And then he put like hot dog stand and all of a sudden visibility went way down because obviously that was unrelated. We see the same thing with car dealerships where car dealerships will say, uh, they'll they'll list car service as a category. And car service is like an Uber, like you call and you get a ride. That's not what car dealerships do. They will also go and say, well, we appraise the value of your trade-in when you trade in a car. So they'll put appraisal service as a category. Well, appraisal service is not in any way related to anything to a car dealership. And that can potentially cause some confusion there. So make sure you're only choosing categories that actually apply to what your business does and the services that you provide or the things that you sell. But yeah, select whichever ones apply. Plepper has a really awesome interactive category list that you can select a category and then it will show you related categories that are often chosen along with that. So if you're confused and you're not sure what's there and you don't want to just sit there and trial and error type stuff in to see what's available, that Plepper list is awesome. And I will look up the link right now as Ben is answering his next question. (laughs) Which is a great, great answer, by the way. Oh, hey, we do have something from Chris before we move on to that. But uh, Google shows who's way who's more who's categories who's than I can choose in the first place. Yes, there are more yes. categories. In many cases, for verticals, there are much more than 10 categories available that do apply. You know, I work with a ton of car dealers, and that's definitely an issue with car dealers. And they actually have unique rules for car dealers where you can basically do things that normal businesses aren't allowed with separate departments that don't actually have separate signage and separate entrances, but Google has changed the rules specifically for car dealers. So you have your main listing for sales, then you can have a service department and you can have a parts department. And in all three situations, there are more than 10 categories that you could choose for any one of those three. 
So then it just comes down to your strategy and you need to strategically place the ones that are most important to your business goals. Yeah. But Chris might be talking about something different here. Maybe, maybe. And you could uh, validate this, Chris. He might be talking about there's more categories than he chose initially. That's possible because Google will. Okay. Yeah. So Google will okay. insert categories, saying. right? Um but the question would be, is, is it on the info tab or is it on the services tab? Because sometimes people get those confused. Mm -hmm. They'll see more services than they offer and they can kind of confuse those with categories. So I don't know if that's maybe your issue. Oh, okay. Gotcha. <laughs> Check that. <laughs> yeah. But, but it is true. Sometimes Google will insert more categories than what you've chosen if they show up in orange then that's what's going on. Uh, and then you can just safely go ahead and remove those. Okay, cool. All right, so what do we got, Greg? All right, so now up for you. Uh, the question comes from Savannah. And Savannah's question is, how do I get rid of non-legitimate GBP accounts created for my company by a marketing company that no longer exists created? So the marketing company that, is not in business and does not exist anymore, created all of these and they want to get rid of them. So details, a marketing company set up several GBP accounts in different areas that need to be closed. We have two legitimate locations and want to keep those two accounts. One of them has over a hundred reviews and we don't want to lose those reviews while we're getting rid of the extra accounts. Okay. I'm going to read this one more time because it's, this is a very specific scenario. I've dealt with it before though. Okay, so um, I don't know if Savannah is with us at the moment, but um, basically in this situation, what you have to do is you need to get the emerge completed. So what's going to have be important here is that the listings are unclaimed, okay? Because you have to have a claimed listing. Uh, there you are, Savannah. You're welcome. So you have to have a claimed listing in your account, and then you have to have a listing which is unclaimed. Now, if this was created by a marketing company, let's see, are these, serv uh, are these service area-based businesses or storefronts, by the way? That's very important. So uh, while you're answering that, basically if, um, yeah, so the, you have to go through the claiming process first if they're not, if they're not around anymore. So you go through the claiming, basically, if it's a storefront or a service area-based business, it's a totally separate process. Um, okay, so they're showing their address. Perfect, that's good. So as long as the phone number, name, and or website URL is the same as it is on the profile to which you wanna to merge to, you're gonna be successful. How you go about it? You click on, is this own this business, claim this listing. You'll go ahead, it'll say it's currently claimed by hint email address. And then what you'll do is, is you'll very simply request a postcard. You wanna claim it. So you'll put your, your name in there, your company name, show my email address, ownership, and then you'll hit submit. You will have, you'll get an email, hold on to that email because it has a nice blue button in there that you're gonna need. But, um, now you get to wait three days. And basically, if they have not replied in three days, which they won't because they're out of business, but if they haven't replied in three days, then you click on that email and you click on that blue button and it'll take you to the dashboard and you're going to be able to start the verification process again. Now, what's important here is, is how you do this. You want to do this in a separate account, okay? That's very important. You don't want to do it in the account where the other listing is because you could get, end up getting really badly flagged as dupe. So you'll go ahead, you will then verify it, and then you will remove yourself from that second listing. The reason is, is that now you're going to reach out to support and you're going to tell support, here's my real listing, here's the duplicate listing, please merge it. And then the Google will go ahead and they'll take their time and you know, I'm just joking. They'll go ahead and they'll merge the uh, two together, but that's the process. It's a little bit lengthy, but uh, that's how you do it. What do you got, Greg? Anything to add to that? No, that was an excellent 
Excellent answer. Oh, thank you. Okay, so cool. So uh, next question. Offer posts are showing on deals tab. What's up with that, man? Yeah, so Claire tweeted that out. And now apparently there is a, on mobile, a little deals tab slash button and if you have uh gbp posts that are offer posts they're showing up under that deals tab so that's a an interesting thing that i think barry would say yep it's new <laughs> yep all right sorry i gotta answer here really quick for savannah okay well cool thank you i mean you know I, I remember when posts first came out and when they removed them from being up high on the, the yeah. knowledge panel to down at the bottom, everybody was like, posts are dead, posts are dead, posts are dead. Yeah, no, posts are definitely not dead. Posts are awesome. <laughs> like if you do, well, posts are not dead as long as you do them the right way. A lot of people treat them like social media and they, they share yeah. just social crap on there yeah. and it's not social media you need to treat it like it's a free advertisement and if you do that you can do great stuff with posts yeah, and you can convert a heck of a lot of sales into it too yeah you can big time big time but uh but i love i love the fact of what they're doing here i mean it, this is actually it's kind of a it's a nice pattern if you think about it right because first you have regular posts which show up under related searches on mobile over a top, right? When you're searching for something, you click on a competitor, bam, tons of posts. Um, so you've got that. Now, then we had Q&A, which started showing up above businesses on mobile and now offer posts. It kind of sucks, but it's kind of cool too at the same time. <laughs> as long as you've got offers that are legitimate offers, because again, you got to use posts the right way. And I've seen some really janky stuff out there where people put in some sort of an offer post and it's not really an offer. It's just, they're trying to list their products and right. that's usually not going to be effective. Yep. Be, be real, be transparent. Come on, don't try to game the system people. Yeah, exactly. So right. now we've got one for you. That okay. is a question. From Melissa Howell. Melissa, pipe in and chat and say hi if you're here. And if not, uh, pretend that you're putting it in chat when you're watching the recording later. Uh, the question is, even though they have a map pin, if you just go to the city that some of our clients are in and zoom all the way in on the client's location, they don't show on Google Maps. They do show for branded and keyword searches, just not if you go to maps and zoom all the way in on that location in a city. Is there anything that they can do about that? Short answer, no. Now, why? It's pretty simple, actually. There's a lot of places on Google Maps. There's a lot of place labels. There's a lot of storefronts, service area businesses, all sorts of pieces of data. So Google has to be able to figure out what to show you and more importantly, why. So when you're doing just no searching whatsoever and you're just zooming in, it's going to show you what it thinks your intent basically is. And at that point you have no intent. So the chances of it showing exactly what you're looking for is extremely small, I guess. And people don't search that way, by the way, either. So that's another thing. So it really doesn't hurt your client. And if your client's asking you about it, like, hey, how come I just go to Maps and zoom in and don't see my business? Tell them that. Look, you're the only person in the world that's doing that and expecting to see your business. So it really isn't hurting. You. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Cool. All right. So, Greg, we have one for you, Ming. Let's do it. All right. Seems like posts last a lot longer than they used to on listings. I think COVID updates used to be 14 days. Incorrect. And the what's new style posts were seven days. Correct. At one point. But now they seem to last indefinitely or until deleted. Is this the new norm? Shall we be, de de be deleting old post content? So I think the first so thing there's a is couple of things to unpack with this one. Yes. First of all, most importantly, yes. It did used to be seven days, which is why a lot of people will do that weekly post cadence because it used to be that if you did a post, 
on Monday, the next Monday, you did to do another post because that post no longer existed. Now it's six months of time. So that post, a what's new post. Now keep in mind, the offer posts and the event posts will only stay up and be visible for the date range that you have selected for those posts. But if you're using the what's new post template, that post will now stay visible for six months. So you don't necessarily need to post on a weekly basis if you're posting the same thing over and over again. You can put it up once, it's gonna stay live for forever, or not forever, but for six months. Uh, the second bit, uh, do you need to be deleting old posts? Not really, if you have something new to share, just share the new thing and the other thing stays there in the, the, you know, the carousel and it gets further and further buried the more often you post something. Unless something has changed with your business or circumstances, there's no need to go back and delete old stuff unless it's something that changed and you need to not have it be visible anymore. Yeah, let's, uh, like, I've let's... seen lately, you know, we've edited things and people will put up a post that says, hey, we're closed on Easter. You don't really need to do that in a post. Just use the holiday hours to have it temporarily update your hours and say that you're closed on Easter because then you're left with a post that is up for the next six months that says, hey, we're closed on Easter. And some businesses, that's the only kind of thing they do. I've been auditing a lot of car dealership stuff lately for a, a research project we're working on. And I came across a dealership group that had 25 stores and they all had a message about how they were closed on Thanksgiving and they have not done a post since. So every single one you come to, there's a picture of a turkey and it says, hey, don't forget, we're closed next week on Thanksgiving. And that doesn't make sense. So yeah, in that case, probably go delete that post so it's not showing or share something new because I mean, Thanksgiving was six months ago, guys. So in other words, if you uh, put up a post about your underwater basket weaving classes that you hold and all the time, right, Greg? Yeah, exactly. Uh, but now you've stopped. You should probably go back and delete those posts. Or you should probably realistically go back and start doing your underwater basket weaving classes again. Cause come on, everybody that's needs those. That's so freaking important. I agree. I yeah. agree. No, but so seriously, then, it, it's, you know, it, it's, it's good. Uh, COVID posts, I don't know if they last for 14 days or not. I think it's actually a little bit longer. Um, don't use them though. Like yeah. what, what the, the problem with COVID posts that most people don't realize they like them cause it shows up way higher. Uh, but it's text only. You can't have a photo associated. And if you're using a COVID post, then all of your other posts are hidden. Get so covered. if you have an offer post and an event post and a what's new post, and then you go use a COVID post, those other three posts are going to disappear for as long as that COVID post is up. There's no real need to use that COVID post. If there is, you know, and right now, I mean, we don't even have to wear masks on planes anymore. It, it, there's not really many COVID restrictions if there is some sort of a resurgence and we do have to remask or you are doing something specifically around COVID that you want to let people know about, just use the what's new post instead. And that way you can still have your other posts going. Yep, exactly. And I guess if you want one more stat about posts, and that is, is that the carousel on your knowledge panel will show up to 10 of the latest, latest posts. So it's another reason to update a weekly if you want. Basically, yep. all of our clients do. All right, you are up next, my friend. Let's do this. And we have a question that has come in. Uh, I'm not from anyone, but you've submitted it. So I guess it came in off of Facebook or something else. But the question is- It was a previous question, yeah. yeah. I have a restaurant client where Google continually changes the attribute to no dine-in. Is there any software that will lock in the attributes so that it won't continue to be changed? Okay. Uh, there is no software that will lock in the attributes. I can tell you this for a fact because we actually do use the API to scan attribute changes. Uh, it's actually better with the new API. It's in the federated version. I don't know if you play with the API at all, Greg, but, but uh, in the old version, you had to compare two lists and just see if it was updated. In the new version, you actually get a differentiation between the two. Um, if you've got the, well, you have to store the data. But anyway, long story short, no, you can't. What you will have to do is reach out to support first, ask them to lock it in for you, and let's see if they can do it. They probably won't. Um, so what you next, next thing you'll need to do is to come to the community. One of us PEs can escalate it for you to Google and see if they can lock it in. Probably not. What I would definitely make sure you do is, is that you go on your website, make sure you do put in, dine, you know, make it that you have stay, that you have dine-in available. Um, 
Go to places like Yelp, et cetera, where they do allow you to set these attributes and set them there too. Google relies on third-party data all the time. Now, we don't know if this is where they're, where they're pulling it from, but you want to cover all your bases. I don't know. Anything else on that one, Kirk? No, that covers it. That was an excellent answer, my friend. All right, dude. Sounds good. Thank you. All right. Now, uh, the question that we get all the time. Gosh, how do I remove a negative review? Uh, The easy answer is you don't remove a negative review. Now, if it is breaking terms of service, if it is clearly a employee and it states explicitly in the text that I work here and this place sucks, then you can get it removed because employees aren't allowed to review a business. If it uses hate speech or, you know, bad language, potentially get that removed as well. Uh, If it's clearly a review for another business and it states that it's a review for another business and it's not the correct business, you can get that removed. But most of the time people are saying, hey, I know this wasn't a customer and they left this bad review. How do I get it removed? Google's not going to let you remove a review just because you say it's not a customer, because then any business out there could say, oh, yeah, that's not my customer and get a review removed. So it's exceedingly difficult to get a negative review removed, especially if it's a negative review that has no text associated with it. If it is just a one star review with no text, you're probably not going to be able to get that removed unless there is enough of a very clear pattern to show that that was review abuse. So it was an abuse network and fake profiles. And it's got to be a pretty egregious example that is very easy to detect. In that case, yeah, if you're getting spammed with bad reviews and it's a network of clearly fake profiles, then, yeah, you can go over to the forum and post that and, you know, potentially go try to report those reviews and have Google review them. Sometimes they're just going to come back and actually a lot of the time they're going to come back and say, no, there's nothing wrong. We're not going to get these removed. And then you can go to the forum and then one of the PEs will escalate and you can typically get those removed. But if you're just talking about a one off of somebody's like, oh, this guy sucks. And you look at the name and you don't recognize the name and you're a business that keeps track of your customers. You're probably not going to have any luck removing that. But I do have a video. I'll look up the link here when Ben is chiming in on his answer to this. Uh, where I talk about the best case scenario in those situations is to just leave a strategic review response where you say something like, hey, Ben, we've done a search of our client records and we have no record of ever even talking to you or you ever coming into our store. We're not sure why you wanted to leave a bad review with a fake name, but if you do have a legitimate complaint, please call us and let us know who you are and what actually happened because we'd love to make that situation right. That's exactly right. Two things happen there. First of all, people see that you care about a bad review and you're not just going to say, oh, this is fake, but you actually leave a a thoughtful response. Second of all, that's going to make people discount that review. They're going to go, oh, yeah, that's probably a fake review. I don't need to pay attention to that review. So long answer again. What's what's your (laughs) side? Tell us what you have to say. I'll I'll look at that review uh, video I can share. So, you, you know, this is, this, is the, this is the interesting thing is whenever Greg comes back from an event, he's just like totally charged up and he just like goes and fired on and on and on and on and on. And you know what? And uh, you know what, my friend, that was a fantastic answer, actually. Um, yes, it, it is. Although it deserved it, it depends in the beginning. I'm just saying. There we go. Uh, it depends. There late. we go. All right. No, but yeah, I, you know, I agree with actually everything that you've said all, all, so far. Um, all of it. You know, so might as well just write a blog post on it. Oh, wait, probably. Oh, we don't have to. There's the link I just shared that talks about what to do. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, it, it's extremely difficult. I mean, I'm dealing with some cases right now. We have a, a review removal service. Um, somebody I talked to yesterday, you know, they're under complete attack. And you can tell that they're under attack. And, but the way that it's being done is super duper smart. I mean, we're talking like, n- The language is all the same. They're not reviewing multiple people in the same category or even the same city. And uh, and there's no pattern. And it's a real shame because they've gotten like over 175 one-star with content reviews. And I'm giving it about a 32% chance for removal. And, um, you know, but on the flip side of that, I got another client who has two locations. They're getting hit by with about 30 a day all one star, no content. 
that I've actually had a lot of success in getting removed um, because there's a definitive pattern. They get a positive review and immediately get flooded with negative reviews. So, um, yeah, and John, oh. Trisha's dead on that, you know, it's really difficult to prove who's an employee and who's not because anybody can create any meme when it comes to uh, Google accounts. So that's the hard part. Uh, I've got a sound effect for me. Uh, I, thanks to everyone and Chris uh, just now pointing out that they're not seeing my links. I didn't realize I was set to only share with panelists and not everyone. So I apologize to everyone. Ah! Who, where are your links, Greg? So here's oh, the no. link right here to the video of how to <laughs> respond to bad reviews. And I will reshare the other ones that I shared earlier uh, as Ben answers the next question. Well, actually, which is we need to come off of that list and go into Q and A because we've got. Oh, we do. Let's go into Q and A. So you take the yeah. first one while I'm resharing my links. <laughs> All right, sounds good. All right, so um, what do we got? Uh, hey, it's from Trisha. Hey, Trisha. So if there are two LLCs that are SABs with the same address and owner. But different phone numbers and websites. I know where you're going with this, but different but related primary categories. And their GBPs, kudos, you said GBP, and are uh, okay, or are the okay, are the GPPs okay, or will they constantly be fighting Google for merging them or deleting one? Actually, uh because they're sharing the same address, more than likely they're going to be out of somebody's home. And that being the case, the bigger challenge that you're going to have here is, yep, okay, so is that Google may actually uh, confuse the two and just decide to suspend them both. So we see that all the time. If they are okay now and you've been able to go through the verification process and they're both published, which is that's what it appears to be, then uh, you're okay. However, I would definitely think about because they are related to with each other, I would think about, I would put a tracking number on both of them, find out which one's actually going to get the most amount of traffic and then go ahead and move that puppy out to its own place. Yep. That's going to be your best bet. All right. So we have an anonymous attendee that has a question for you, Greg. Bring it on. Uh, yes, Trisha, that exactly. Basically having two business profiles at the same address, which is a home is a red flag. You know, I um, feel like at this point, Trisha's like our, our band guy, our, our band director guy. Like they always have on the late night talk show that adds like color commentary because she's always here and she's always got contributions. So like <laughs> Trisha, we really appreciate the fact that you're always around and always participating. And you know what, Trisha, one of these days, I think we need to get you up here. Yeah, we totally should. Yep, definitely. Pop me an email or send me a, a, a tweet. DM. Okay. So, good. Excellent. How about uh, two weeks from now? Okay. <laughs> okay. So, anonymous attendee. I manage a number of franchise-based Google business profiles. First thing I'll say there is, is I'm sorry to hear that. No, just kidding. Um, okay. I have a lot of experience with franchises. So there's little to no, almost no control over the websites themselves, which are stuck in 1990. This is usually constantly true. No type of city or location pages to help boost local SEO. Sorry to hear that. Yex is used for citations. Sorry to hear that. But necessary <laughs> evil in franchises. Uh, not allowed to create citations outside of that. Well, that's kind of shitty. Uh, GPP listings are fully optimized and ranking high near address location, but past that having ranking issues, sounds like it's a little bit uh, because of the uh, proximity update. Any suggestions on what can be done? Greg, that's a lot. So have fun, man. It depends. Um, actually it doesn't depend. That sounds like a sucky situation. I honestly wouldn't want to take on and be a part of because if you can't touch the website and you can't do any citations, you 
can't do any link building realistically if you're not able to touch the site. All you have control over is the GVP. I would just make sure you have done everything that you can do to that GVP to make it as awesome as possible. Make sure you are loading amazing photos into each of the locations and that you're updating photos on a fairly regular basis. Make sure that you've got every possible category selected that could be selected. Make sure you've got the right primary category chosen. Make sure you've preloaded questions into the Q&A and answered those questions. Not that that affects ranking, but it will help you get potentially better click-throughs and conversions off of what visibility you do have. And same thing with posts. Do post and do post the right way to enhance any you know, potential chance of showing up you know, or, or standing out from competitors. Again, not going to matter for ranking, but will help you get more out of whatever visibility you do have. But yeah, I mean, it's like you're trying to run a, a, a race and a boxing match in a triathlon with you know, your, your ankles tied together and one hand tied behind your back, there's not really a whole lot you're going to be able to do, unfortunately. Yeah, it's kind of like, you know, basically you've got a Flintstone car, right? You got no engine. You're running on your feet, basically. Yeah. Um, here's my suggestion. And it's not going to be having to do with anything about Google business profiles or anything else, actually. It's going to be about how you treat the client, the client customer or whoever your bosses are. Uh, and that is this, is with a franchise it really, really helps to get all decision makers and stakeholders in the room at the same time. This way, you can start talking about issues, delegating issues, and get everybody on the same page. This is the biggest problem that franchises have, is nobody's on the same page. It's not my problem. It's not, that's not my department. Oh, that's social media's department. No, it's not. It's CFO's department. Oh, no, it's the CMO's department. You know, oh, no, it's Johnny because Johnny does digital, right? Whatever. And everybody just passes the buck. So get everybody in the same room. Talk about the issues. Assign them and then take care of them. That's method one. And I think you should do method one even if you do method two. Method two. Re, uh, again, depending on your situation, because I don't know if you're a client or if you work for this franchise or not, but basically, uh, if you work for the franchise, make sure you read over the franchisee agreement. Does it specifically state that the franchisor controls all aspects of marketing? If it doesn't, then you can probably get your own domain and you can probably build out your own website and then build out your own citations. So you need to figure that out. Second, uh, basically, and hopefully you have enough ability to do all of that. Um, yeah. So, okay, cool. Next question. Let's see. Do QAs help your GPP? If so, do you have any advice on getting people to do that in a white hat manner? <laughs> you know, it. when we're saying help your GBP, ah. Uh, it depends. Because it really depends on what you mean by help your GBP. If you mean help it rank better, no, it's not going to help you rank better. If you mean help it convert more customers, then heck yeah, the Q&A section is really powerful. It's just a lot of people don't use it much. And a lot of people don't even realize still that it's there because really the Q&A section is a community discussion widget that's a feature of Google Maps that's just displayed in your GBP, so it's not in the back end dashboard. And so a lot of people don't even realize it's there because they don't really interact with it out in search, even though now you can edit it in search. So yeah, you're actually able to upload your own questions, ask your own questions and answer those questions yourself. Completely allowed, totally white hat, do that. Now, if you're talking about how do you get the general public to do it in a white hat manner, uh, you can't really control <laughs> what anybody else does. And there are a bunch of yahoos out there and there's a lot of people that just don't understand. Uh, most people think that when you click ask a question that it's messaging or, uh, or instant chat and that there's somebody on the other end waiting to answer that question. That's why it's so important to monitor the Q and a section. But you know, when you say, is there a white hat way to get people to do this? Yeah. Don't, don't rely on trying to get other people to ask questions just ask your own questions. Put your common questions in there. The reason being, if I was to go to that GBP and click ask a question and I start typing a question in, if a similar question has been asked and answered in the past, 
or if it is close enough to content that is in a review, Google will actually automatically display the answer to the question as I'm typing it. And that's an amazing experience for somebody that is considering doing business with you because if they have a question and they're asking that question because they haven't gone to your site yet or they weren't able to find it on your site, it is more of an almost an instant messaging slash chat solution if that question has already been asked and answered and they start to type a similar question in, it automatically supplies that answer before they're even done typing. They're a heck of a lot more likely to convert into a customer at that point. So that's why you want to do it that way. Yep, I completely agree. Okay. All right. Let's see. Just doing some stuff here real quick. Okay. Anonymous attendee asks, what are your thoughts on service pages when they do not have a physical address in that city but offer services in the city, i.e. plumber ranking well in the city but not neighboring cities that they service yeah that's the link that i shared earlier to city pages so i've already shared the link in chat so mr or mrs anonymous attendee i will share it in chat right now again a link to a video i did about city pages cool uh yeah but but ben like i mean i didn't really get into it before i just mentioned it so let's chat about it a minute uh yeah i mean um let me see we got four minutes left here so Yes, basically. Even if you're a service area-based business with no quote-unquote physical location, then yeah, doing service pages is a good idea. Can you control it to have it not show in neighboring cities? No, you can't control it. Uh, that's organic, basically. All right, so let's see. Uh, do, 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 do. Okay, so next question for you, bud. All right, so we are kind of already, well, I'll, I will ask it. Um, we're talking about categories before. Switching primary categories based on season. Good idea. Oh, yeah, great idea. And it happens all the time. You've got those guys that, you know, they do landscaping in the spring and summer, and in the fall they're doing, you know, Christmas lights and raking leaves and, and whatnot. So, yeah, uh, you know, or like tour companies that only operate in the summer doing whitewater rafting but they do snowshoeing tours or snowmobile tours in the winter. Like, yeah, completely. You can change your categories based on seasonality and, and, and even not necessarily select different categories, but just change which one is primary uh, based on season. No reason not to. Right on. All right. John has a question. Happy Friday, guys. Happy Friday, John. Thanks for joining us. Um, basically, it's a reference to an old question. The, the gist of it is this post is getting basically what appears to be filtered, did a test, and it was able to publish the post with no photo. So it's been going on for over a year. Uh, I'll take this one real quick, Greg. Yeah, sure. Because it's a quick answer. So um, it depends on what, you know, category that you're in, but more than likely, you know, it's like mold or something like that, or, you know, some kind of like a lawyer or sexual reference, um, something that Google doesn't like about the photo. So basically take that photo, run it through Google's vision AI tool, basically just look up Google vision AI and see if it comes back as racy or suggestive or violent or something like that. More than likely, it's the image. So if you be able to get it done without the image, you're probably, yeah, it's going to have to be the image. Something with the image for sure. Well, okay. And they're saying if it includes any picture at all. Okay. You've, you've tried many images. You will want to reach out to support first, ask them the question. They will be useless. They will give you an answer that makes zero sense. Well, and then what you want to do is take that case ID, go to the community, open up a thread and one of the product experts <clears throat> can escalate it for you. More than likely you ran afoul of the content policy and it's been basically the listing has been in a sense blacklisted from posting photos, but that would have to be debugged. Yeah. Especially if it's a spa, like you did mention it's a spa. So if they were showing, you know, potentially pictures of massages, it could have gotten tagged for nudity, even though there wasn't nudity in the photo and it would have been yeah. sexual connotation to the images and if you did that too many times, exactly like Ben said, you're gonna get you're gonna get busted, and you're not gonna be able to do any images until someone debugs that and fixes it for you. Yeah, and John has a follow up. Basically, is it better to just create a new listing um, if it's that important to you, but you're gonna lose all your ranking? So I don't know if it's worth it just to do posts. You know, I, I 
I don't know. I, I would try to get it fixed. I wouldn't go ahead and create a new listing personally. That's just me though. Um, and our last question comes from Chris Garvey and this is for you, Greg. Finally got my first review two weeks ago. Congratulations. Uh, Google only showed the five-star rating, but said there was no review. But I know the client, and they put a fairly lengthy review. Did links to the demo sites get it removed? So wait, you're saying you have a review with a five-star rating, but there's no review. So you mean no... So it's showing that he has a five-star rating on the profile, but no reviews are displayed. But then I'm questioning, Chris, if you're still around, can you clarify what you mean by did links to the demo site of hers and my site link get it removed? Yeah. That's, uh, I'm thinking maybe that means there were multiple URLs in the content of the review. And if that's the case, yeah, it could have been something with she put a link to the demo site I created and a link to my website. Yeah, potentially that could have been seen as spam because there are multiple links in the review content. Yeah. Uh, that's probably what it was. Uh, if you have her go back and edit that review and remove those links, see if it then pops in and appears. Yeah. Yeah, because links are not allowed. So neither are phone numbers, by the way. So, um, yeah, no, that's about the only way you can answer that. Although I, I find it very intriguing that they're showing a five-star rating even though they have no review. Yeah, that's odd. That's really odd. Um, Chris, because it sounds really interesting and cool, uh, DM me at the social dude with a link to your Google business profile. I'd like to personally go take a look at it really quick. Yeah, I'd like to see that too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, okay, cool. Well, with that, we have another episode on the books. Uh, the link is, is just hit me up on Twitter. So, um, there you go. So, uh, we have another episode on the books. So, I want to thank Greg, my, my faithful, awesome, smart dude co host, for joining us. And uh, we will be back in two weeks, more than likely, with Trisha as our guest now. So, <laughs> that'll be totally excellent. <laughs> <laughs> so but uh, thanks everybody do feel free please to hit us up on the form and submit any questions that you might have for us we actually got through a massive number of questions today we got through them all yeah. so that's a first so uh, yeah so please do and that's it with that have a great weekend see y'all in two weeks bye